Uh, uh, one question that's come up um, about uh, schools for missionary kids. This isn't in my presentation, so I thought I'd, I'd mention it. Uh, the question is, do the missionary kids learn the national language? And uh, it depends on their situation. Like if a Korean missionary kid working in, uh, their family working in Indonesia, um, their first priority when they come to Indonesia is to learn English so they can attend our school because it's a school in English. But oftentimes they'll learn uh, Indonesian or Javanese or both in addition to English. Our school was required by the government actually to teach the Indonesian language, so um, all our students went through an Indonesian language program. I don't know if that's true in all the countries. In some countries, you know, if you're, if you're working in, like there's a school in uh, Germany, it's called Black Force Academy. It's uh, kind of in where France, Germany, and uh, Switzerland are all kind of in that, that border area. And uh, those kids come from mission stations all over Europe. So that wherever they're living, it'll be different than where, they're li where they are at their missionary school. So the school's in English. They may be a German national. Um, now that wouldn't make sense. They would be a German national probably. Because they'd probably be schooling in Germany. But um, say an American working in Uzbekistan would send their kid to Germany to learn in English. So it, the parents maybe would they, they learn the, the national language where they worked, but a lot of times those types of third culture kids are going to be more immersed in English, for example, and maybe German because that's where they live. So it gets pretty complicated in terms of what languages they learn. Tim and Micah, Micah's Tim's brother, um, their subculture was English speaking, so their friends, even though they were Korean or whatever, they spoke English. And they didn't have a lot of friends in the Indonesian neighborhoods. Um, that's just the way it was for them. Other kids, um, my, our youngest son Micah, one of his um, roommate's brothers in Florida, they're from Lakeland originally, but this guy, he grew up in, the, in a neighborhood in Indonesia. He knew Javanese and Indonesian. He walked around barefoot with all the neighborhood kids. I mean, that, he just got immersed in that. Um, knew English because that's where he, you know, his parents spoke English at home. But, but he grew up just like a little tribal, little little, na little national kid, knowing the language. So it really depends on where they go in terms of what the language, what the kids learn, and again their proficiency in. Indonesian or the national language is going to change depending on their if they're outgoing or not. Um, you know, you guys, a lot of you know Jazzy Manukian, right? Um, her uh, cousins from Armenia are, are have moved to Salt Lake City and they're living um, living there. And the, I think they have two or three kids. And one of the one of the children is very shy and doesn't like to interact with people and they're having a really hard time learning English where the other kids are like becoming fluent by the day because they're more social people and that's true of adults and it's true of kids uh, as well when it comes to language. Uh, we're going to look a little bit again at the whole education aspect of things um, and why MK Ministries are vital. Mr. Zook talked a little bit about this because sometimes People can't be there if, they, if there's nothing for their, their kids to do. So another time for reflection. I don't think I have a spot for you to write this down. But think about these questions. You are 10 years old. Your parents may have left. This might have actually fit one of these guys. How old were you guys when you... Yeah. You were 10 when you moved overseas. I mean, Tim was three and Micah was eight months, so they didn't have a lot of, a lot of thought process. But just kind of think. Still don't. No thought process. 
They didn't think like a ten-year-old. That's what. They did. <laughs> Just think about what. What do you think it would have been like for you at ten to move to Papua New Guinea or Indonesia or Russia or Uzbekistan or Thailand or wherever? What was it like for you, Derek? It was hard. What made it hard? Uh, no family, no friends. I uh, didn't know when we'd see them again. Totally different culture. Uh, very depress depressing culture. Uh, really didn't have any desire to, you know, get to know the native people, you know, the Russian people. Um, as a result, I, I didn't socialize, like you're saying, as much, and I don't know as much of the language because of that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was hard because we didn't, you know, fully understand what our parents were doing. So we just had questions about that as well. And, and you didn't have a missionary kid school to go to either, did you? Yeah. So we sort of did for a little bit, but we had already started homeschooling. Okay. So we did like a couple classes with. Some of the other teachers. So you had some connection to other kids and a little bit at first and then when we moved we moved the students less. Okay. So this is an important thing. Fears. What do you think you'd be afraid of if you were ten and moving to another country? I think Derek already touched on some of those things. What would you be what would be a fear? I mean, if you're a super social Ten-year-old girl, I can just admit. I never had girls as daughters. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, you were my girl. What did you study? Oh, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> but I can just imagine, I, I would have been a terrible father of daughters. <laughs> just ima I can just imagine a 10 year old girl that was just really into their friends and whatever 10 year old girls do, I don't even know. Um, I mean, dragging them overseas, uh, out of their neighborhoods and out of the things that are comfortable, you know, where they have horses or whatever, you know. <laughs> I mean, a ten-year-old Lena dragging her off the ranch. That would have been hard, right? <laughs> Needs, school, friends. Um, what would the school be like? And, and you know, there's some countries where the, the child goes to a national school. I understand at the at the classical academy next door, they're uh, they're going to get a new student this next year who's parents lived overseas in Germany or someplace and they went to German school and now they're moving back to America and they're going to go to an American school. I mean those types of things are difficult too. Um, one of our parents said this, if Mountain View School is the name of the school that we worked at was not here, our ministry would not be possible. Many people in Indonesia are seeing and receiving the love of Christ because of service Mountain View is to the missionary community. Unquote. Here's one mission board, this is in New Tribes, in just one country, Indonesia. 60% um, of all the foreigners in that organization were kids. So when you talk about missions, it's not just the mom, dad, church planner you're talking about, you're talking about the whole family. I mean, in the Zooks situation, 67% of their family were kids. Right? Four kids? Two thirds? I did math right? You look from 66.666667. So here's, here it was. Uh, few years ago in Indonesia. Missionary kids in Indonesia, married missionaries, and single missionaries. 
mean, it's crazy how important the children are in missions. Look at that good looking young missionary kid. Uh, we had taken a helicopter and flew into a, a village with Mr. Pyle when he was doing, um, doing some flight training. And uh, we got a chance to walk around in the jungle there. Here's some educational options. National schools, homeschooling, international school, which is a non-Christian school, secular, very expensive. Uh, international MK schools or boarding schools. Um, stay home. That happens sometimes. Parents go overseas. Children stay with aunts and uncles. Go to school in America. Online schools, that's becoming more and more possible. But what is best? What is best? Now, if you're a 12-year-old girl, missionary kid, you're growing up, you're growing up in the jungles of Papua New Guinea or Indonesia or some African countries or whatever, and all your friends that you grew up with in the tribe, in the village, at 11, 12 years old, they're getting married. So in those kind of contexts, it's pretty important sometimes for those girls to leave the village at age 11 and 12 and go to a boarding school. I mean, that's, that's a hard decision. They're the parents. Do you leave as a family because of this or do you use a boarding school? And you could have all kinds of debate about boarding schools. There's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly um, with experience and with, you know, there's many sides of the coin on that. But just think of the difficulty of the decision before you judge someone and what decision they make. That's my point. It's difficult. All over the world, there's missionary kids' schools. Um, New Tribes Mission Alone had positions, this is a number of years ago, for short-term people, six months to four years service. They had literally hundreds of things on their website years ago. Now, you guys did a little bit of searching, just to kind of shout out some of the jobs you saw uh, on the websites that you looked at. Anybody? Uh, MAF, missionary pilot. Pilot? Linguistics technician. Linguistics technician. What do you think a linguistics technician is? I have a full message. What is it? <laughs> they um, go around collecting and analyzing stuff from uh, local languages. So they're actually surveying the region, surveying um, the unreached people groups, the languages in that area, and getting data um, for future use, for maybe recruiting, for placement of missionaries, for maybe finding strategic areas like, okay, these five languages are kind of linguistically close, so that would be our strategy to place a missionary the church of plant in this region so that they can have an impact to this broader area. So if you don't have that data, and you don't have someone that can get that data, it's harder to do that ministry. And that's, they're not planting churches, they're just gathering data. Others? Yeah. You're scratching your head. You had your um, like arts and graphic design. Okay, art, graphic design. Yeah. It's like camp workers. Like okay. Working at Cape College, we saw design. <laughs> camp workers. <laughs> yes. Even just discipleship. Okay. People all want to do that. Discipleship. So, I hope you get a, got a taste for the numbers of things that are out there that that you can be involved with. Some of them directly with unreached people groups, some necessary to work with unreached people groups. So really the, the list is quite long. I already mentioned some of the educational or MK ministry type support ministries um, that are involved. Uh, one of them is, on the bottom here is re-entry and transition. I mean, it used to be really difficult, especially in new tribes, the second man, uh, we had Here's a, here's a child that's homeschooled in the tribe. They get up in the morning. They put on their shorts, little boy. That's all they wear all day long. They go out with their friends. 
they fish, they shoot things with their bows and arrows, they go back home, maybe homeschooled for about three hours, and they do that all day, they grow up, and then they go back to America, and wham, reality <laughs> hits them. It's like, oh, I'm not in the jungle anymore. So helping them in that reentry and transition is an important aspect, either overseas or here. I just want to say, guest houses are a huge blessing to missionaries. I know my parents can attest to that. Uh, just having places in the world where missionaries, as they're traveling through a country, they can stay with the visa issues. My parents often stay with the guest house and things, and just to get away, to have a break. Because as my dad was saying yesterday, a lot of times missionaries don't get too many breaks, and so people that provide those types of support things, it's really big. We stayed at the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, which used to be China in the mission, mission guest house in Singapore once. They had a huge guest facility. I'm trying to think how many rooms were in there, probably 30 some rooms. But it was a hub for people to get sent from Singapore out to China and around that area. And they they come back for conferences. And it was just a really a vital ministry there, there in Singapore. And, and not just tribal, I guess. All missionaries could use these guest houses, for example. Just kind of interesting guest house story. Uh, there was this couple, they were from the States, I think. In fact, no, the original couple was, I think they were may have had a Jewish background. They were living in Bolivia, running a guest house for the missionaries, but also there was a couple travelers that came through and they, could, they knew who they were, they are like Jews, and this couple, this couple knew them, they had a the Jewish background, and they invited them to stay with them in this guest house in Bolivia, um, and they weren't even missionaries, they just kind of came through. And, they, and one night they decided, they had dinner with them, and they were just sharing the gospel with them, it didn't matter, they were guest house people that they, they were still committed to the gospel. That's all these, all these support ministries, they're still supporting to the gospel. So they showed a videos, they'd have classes and Bible studies with these backpackers from Israel coming through. And, uh, you know, just sharing the gospel. And some, or maybe it was Germany, I'm getting a little bit mixed up. But anyway, they, uh, the travelers went through and they wrote, someone wrote it in a travel book. Like, you got to come and stay at these people's house in Bolivia. So this whole ministry opened up for them to host backpackers from all over Europe that were traveling through Bolivia, and they shared the gospel with them. And dozens of people came to faith as a result of this kind of thing. And then we had a friends from Indonesia that left Indonesia and were asked to join that ministry in Bolivia. I mean, just totally crazy things can happen in these guest houses. Um, for senders, if you have a missionary family that you're supporting, um, if a family chooses to use like an international school or a, even an MK school, sometimes $6,000 a year per child to pay for that. Transportation. We had a student that took him two days to get from out of his tribe to a national uh, airport and then fly to the boarding school. And then they had to do that to come in one semester, go home for Christmas, come second semester, go home, and back. Eight days of travel just to get back and forth to school. That seems normal for college students and stuff, but not for back in the day first graders. That's not done as much anymore, but even so, teenagers. Um, and shipping homeschool material overseas, all these types of things are expensive. Let's just think about a couple of questions here as we close this kind of section. I think you've been challenged with this question already. Are you willing? Are you willing to do what God wants you to do? It's a willing heart. It's a worshipful heart. Have you taken the initial step to follow Jesus, to obey Him? 
your daily life. Because if you're not obeying him and following him in your daily life, you know, missions isn't going to be something that's going to be beneficial to you or the people you go to work with. So it starts with that personal relationship with Christ. We talked about needs. Don't be motivated by needs. You'll just be frustrated. We have to be motivated by the love of Christ to do these things. We need to be in the Word, obedient to it. We need to be prepared, equipped to share the Gospel today with the person you meet. We're going to pray tomorrow, but pray every day. And I think... Uh, I think it was Ken said something about being humble before the Lord, or Patrick, just that humility drive you to your knees. Continue to learn. He mentioned this too. Be a lifelong learner as a missionary. Give. And if you don't go, be a giver. Give till it hurts. <laughs> Give till it hurts. Here's a couple of things you can do. If you want to go, yeah. Um, you can uh, make decisions based on ministry focus. Like, like the Lord's really teaching you to be involved in a specific type of ministry. Research that. If you want to go to a, a specific country, research that. A certain type of ministry, an educational ministry, linguistic ministry, uh, whatever it is, you can kind of explore those avenues. Definitely you want to be looking at doctrinal things. I mean, nothing against MAF. Um, I, I've got friends in MAF, and I have uh, one of our missionary kids that we taught in Indonesia with MAF and stuff. But another one of our good friends, he was exploring different mission agencies. Now, New Tribes is very doctrinally distinct. MAF was very doctrinally open. So his joke was, I mean, if you want to... You know, it's probably better to fly with MEF because if you crash, someone in that organization might be able to heal you. Whereas that's not going to happen in New Tribe. <laughs> now that's said in jest, but doctrine can be an important element of, of what you're working with. Okay? You don't want to be a, uh, in the wrong kind of a setting if, if that's going to be an issue with you. Uh, what are the support requirements? You know, what are you going to have to do to go? What are the requirements of that? Um, and then do some interviewing, do some exploring, take an internship. There's lots of things you can do. We were, uh, I was 25 and Mary was 23 when we first were challenged and went overseas for a year. And it wasn't, we weren't, I think by the time we went back to the field, I was 30 and she was 28. So there is a, you know, don't like freak out that, oh, I'm going to be 26 years old and I'm not to the mission field yet. I mean, it does take time, and what God will direct and is that as well. Uh, you can get involved in tent-making ministry. Oh, I should have checked my slides here. Are you sharing the gospel now? I mean, so you got to be careful, like, oh, I haven't shared the gospel, so that means I'm not going to be a missionary. I mean, I think it goes back to your walk with the Lord and your obedience to Him. As you focus on that, these other things will fall into place. Because if you're going to be in a tent-making ministry where you go overseas and say teach English as a second language, or you um, a professor of civil engineering or something in Nepal, whatever, if you're not prepared and actively sharing your faith in your current workplace, what makes you think you're going to share your faith in a workplace overseas, for example? And then the other, you know, one of the other things is what. Hopefully, this isn't going to disappear on me again. Um, what is the educational or experience that you're going to need? We have we have a friend who worked in Indonesia for still there. As a teacher, he was going to be moved from being a teacher to the superintendent of schools, and he did not have an uh, education degree. 
And he was too old, I think. He was like 55. And they have some visa requirements that limit that. So he couldn't do it because he didn't have the right degree and he, didn't, he was too old. Now, you shouldn't have to worry about the too old part, but you might, if you don't have a bachelor's degree, they might not let you into the country. They may say, why do we need you? You don't even have a degree. Why would we give you a visa to help our people when you don't even have an education yourself? So it depends on where you go on what those requirements would be. And it depends on what you do, obviously, and what those requirements would be. Um, so if you want to go to, into a certain type of ministry, that's what the Lord is directing you to, you need to check out what the, uh, um, some of the visa requirements might be to get in to a country. Because you could spend all kinds of time um, trying to go somewhere and you can't get there. Uh, we had friends that went to Indonesia when the visa situation was really horrible. Um, they went to Hawaii they had a connection with a church there, and they waited for the visa. I think it took 11 months. It wasn't a bad place to hang out. The church there actually wanted them to give up missions. This was 33 years ago. Give up missions and just stay and minister in their church in Hawaii. And they said, no, we're going to, I mean, we were committed to go to Indonesia. And by God's grace, they eventually got the visa. I don't know what the hang-up was, if it was educational or what. But those types of things do happen. Um, I think we got, we're pretty good on time. I'm going to show you this video about Indonesia. And I think maybe we'll show, uh, maybe show another Indonesia video too before we get into our Islam 101. So let's see what Hawaii has to say to us today.
This is the way we Moy people live. We make our gardens. We hunt. We build our houses. The spirits watch us. One day, a new voice in the wind terrified me. shared the Creator's talk. A few Moy people listened. I did not. I overheard them say, the Creator is more powerful than all the spirits. I thought, this is lying talk. When some of the Moy people heard the Creator's talk, their hearts became different. At our feasts, they weren't afraid to break the spirit's rules. They hunted whatever they wanted. They weren't even afraid of eating taboo food. I told them, you will soon die for this. Death is small, they told me. The Creator's talk is big. I thought, is this really lying talk? I didn't know. I wondered what the spirits would do. When the centipede bit me, I knew the spirits were angry. My family slashed me.
a death for my debt. But I know there are many people like the Moy. People who do not know the Creator. People who have never heard that Jesus died for them. Who will tell them? There was three couples, actually four. One of the one of the couples that was working in this tribe um, uh, <coughs> left Indonesia, and he's he's the uh, director of NTM in Canada now. Um, uh, the two Americans families that were there, the one couple had two daughters, and the other couple had three daughters. And they homeschooled up to a certain point, and then they, their kids went to a boarding school in this area of West Papua, Indonesia, a uh, different school than what we worked at. Um, and then the third family was an Indonesian family that worked with this group. Um, and I think they're, I'm not sure what they were doing with their kids. Um, that's another whole unique challenge, a thing that um, the American missionaries have been involved with, trying to help some of the national parents and their educational options. In fact, I think uh, there was a, a missionary kids school for nationals created. So there's lots of things that are happening uh, for the missionary kids. Now, we have uh, enough time, I think. Um, can you play a video back there through? Or is it better if I play it up here? Uh, DVD or something? Or DVD, yeah. Do you want to? It's probably better. Okay. Let's, uh, let's play E-Town. Okay. Um, it's an older video, some of you may have seen it, but it gives you, it actually was originally, part in that interface program I showed you, the modern, kind of the brand new video, this video was made 20 years ago as a promo for the interface program when it was first came out. So part of the video talks about that. Um, but this story talks not only about um, God's Word being taught chronologically, it also talks about the missionary effort, his training, um, how old he was, you know, how God used him anyway, lots of things. The fellow that's featured, his name is Zook, it's not spelled Z-U-K, it's a different spelling. Um, and he's now with the Lord. So it's a classic uh, New Tribes video that um, you guys can enjoy. So whenever you're ready to start it, it's about 25, 30 minutes or something like that.